Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the 2023 uh, annual trout stocking meeting. Uh, we're real excited to see, see all you out there um, in this virtual meeting. Um, as of right now, we currently have 125 um, anglers in attendance, so that's good to see. I uh, hope more people join as this meeting goes on. Um, I'm Sean Krause, Bureau Chief for Freshwater Fisheries, and staff has been working really hard around the clock to prepare for this upcoming trout season. Uh, law enforcement's been hanging signs, information education staff have been uh, you know, getting, getting all that information and social media posts up there for you um, and schedules. Our biologists have been uh, working on allocations, making sure that trout are getting spread across the state equitably. Uh, hatchery staff, uh, 365 are working hard to, to keep those fish alive and healthy and, and looking good with some good growth on them and great color. Um, lands management is going to be stocking those fish you know, over, over a 10 week period. So, you know, we have great gratitude for that as well. Um, not to mention it elsewhere without the, uh, throughout the division, uh, including volunteers. Thanks for all your help getting those fish out there. Trucks are being rolling in 16 days. Um, and then with uh, opening day of April 8th coming up, we're all excited and we know you are too. Um, in the past, we've held this meeting uh, in person at the Pequest Trout Hatchery. Um, Due to things such as uh, you know the the, the, uh, the pandemic, uh, we went to an all virtual format that actually worked out really well to the best of our estimates because attendance had increased. We still see a greater attendance right now with 130 people than we've had in the past um, with the live meetings. So um, we're still uh, we you know we we could have gone live this year in person, but we wanted to see if we could be more inclusive to include people. We have busy schedules and it would be traveling from farther throughout the state. Um, just some quick housekeeping as this meeting goes. Uh, it's, a, it's a public meeting in which we intend to get angler feedback. So we, we really highly encourage public participation. You're gonna see some presentations today from staff. Um, you're gonna have opportunity to ask questions. Uh, you'll hear a little bit more about how we're gonna do that later, but you'll be able to ask questions in a question box and also you can raise your hand and we can unmute your microphone and you can ask questions that way. So please, for all staff and for the public, uh, please keep your microphones muted at this point um, until our distinct question and answer periods. One of the neat things we're gonna do uh, at this meeting, uh, this will be our second test at it, is we're gonna be utilizing uh, in this go-to meeting format, uh, some poll questions. So throughout the meeting, we're gonna put some questions up there to get some angler feedback and and at times, uh, if anglers have comments, you know, we, we might utilize their polling uh, ability to see if that comment is popular amongst the angling uh, community. Um, just want to mention that we have a lot of staff here on, on this call today. So um, we, we have staff uh, from, from both of our hatcheries. We have, um, we have our, our fisheries biologists, our staff from lands management, law enforcement, and information education. So. Uh, just know that we're here to, to interact with you. So like I said, we're more than happy to answer your questions. So at this point, I'd like to hand it over, the meeting over to uh, a familiar, uh, familiar face, uh, our assistant director, uh, former Bureau Chief of Freshwater Fisheries, Lisa Barra. It's all yours, Lisa. Thanks, Sean. And good morning, everybody. We really appreciate you joining us today. As you know, we really appreciate and value angler input in helping guide their programs that we do. Um, I have just a couple of recaps from last year on kind of the non-fish side of uh, the agency. Um, to kick it all off, I hope you are all now aware of our new website. Uh, we launched it, I know I mentioned it last year at this meeting that we were working on it. Um, it was a huge undertaking. We launched it in August of 2022. This was a full-scale agency-wide project with over 13,000s of pages that were not only updated in appearance and contact, but they were integrated into WordPress and are also now ADA compliant. I cannot express how much effort this took on so many staff as biologists suddenly became web page designers. Um, but we're really proud of the new look of our website. Um, the organization where it used to be set up how our organization our fish and wildlife was organized um, it is now done by user interest um, so i know sean has a poll question uh, later in the meeting 
popping up now um, to discuss, uh, get some feedback on that. Um, fish and wildlife staffing overall has been uh, up. We are up to 250 staff from a low of 210. Um, that is hugely helpful across all programs. But while our staff may be increasing, unfortunately, our license sales after that huge bump that we saw in 2020 um, is on the decline again. We had in 2022, 162,272 license sales. That is unfortunately a 7.2% decline from 2021. So get the word out, um, tell your friends and take them fishing. On the hunting side, also uh, we're seeing the decline. In 2022, we had 84,000 hunting licenses sold. That is 5% less than 2021. One thing on the horizon for this year though that we hope will help our license sales is that there is a bill in the state legislature that will help fix an error in our buddy fishing license. As many of you are aware, the buddy fishing license will save you almost 50% 50, 50 on the cost of your license, all for just bringing in a friend or family member into fishing, and also applies to two brand new anglers. A lapsed angler is somebody who hasn't bought a license in five years. However, when the legislation was written, instead of having a rolling five-year time period, the statute date was set at 2010. So now that only is applicable for somebody who hasn't bought a license since 2013, so for 13 years. So we will need your support. We're asking you to watch the legislature. The assembly bill was just posted. It's 5227. I just want to shout out, moving over to some of the fish side of things. Uh, shout out to Hatchery Superintendent Craig Lemon. I think we're into 96 plus weeks of his the Go Fish Friday. Um, Craig started this um, and working with INE staff on posting these weekly segments on the Fridays. And we really appreciate the anglers for sharing your stories and the photos. Um, really is great to see everybody enjoying what the staff works so hard and the opportunities to produce. Um, last year, we also added um, another segment to the Close to Home Fishing Explorer app with mapping of the trout stock waters. So hopefully you're all finding that useful. Our lands management staff have been busy uh, with the boat ramps. We have new boat ramps at Stone Tavern, Rising Sun, and Point Pleasant. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions about Greenwood Lake ramp. We are working on it. Uh, with the highlands, there is a limit on the amount of impervious surface, and we're looking at the location at Brown's Point. Um, so we are basically just keep tweaking the design so that we can get as much available parking um, within that location as we possibly can before we would finalize the design for a ramp there. Um, lands management is also going to be looking at Jake's Landing down in Dennis Creek this year of moving that along. And as I'm sure many of you heard, um, we had a bear hunt in December of 2022. That was the result of an emergency rule passed by the Fish and Game Council and was approved by the governor's office, which temporarily enacted the 2022 Comprehensive Black Bear Management Plan. This was due to the concerns of a 237% increase in damage and nuisance complaints. However, the emergency rule is only valid for 60 days. So as of January 14, the temporary CBB MP has expired. But well, we are working on a rule proposal to formally adopt the CBB MP. That public comment period closed on February 3rd, and we're still working on compiling cabinet, the comments from that. The Fish and Game Council will then review the comments and decide how they wish to proceed. As you're probably also aware, we lost the first two days of the December hunt um, due to a lawsuit. We are still um, working and dealing with the um, litigation that's ongoing. 
And then finally, in closing, just uh, events that have been occurring more recently is whales washing up along the shores. Um, these are juvenile whales. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions what going on with the offshore wind, um, but what they believe is the juvenile whales are actually coming in for forage and bait that are coming more inland where there's more boat traffic. Um, the necropsies that have been performed indicate that the whales are um, dying from blunt force trauma, which is consistent with boat strikes. Um, NOAA is actually considering a speed limit restriction, which would be 10 knots for 100 miles offshore for boats that are as small as 35 feet for right whales. And this would be applicable like 15 days after a whale is detected in the area. But again, that's just a recommendation. Um, for that, it remains to be seen if that gets implemented. And before I kick it back to Sean, I just want to mention, because I know probably what a lot of folks have questions today will be concerning when will we be beginning diversifying our hatchery stock? When will we be rearing brown trout potentially again? Right now, we do not have a date, but we do continue to make process, the progress on this. We are currently reviewing some potential designs for supports for solar panels over our raceways. Um, this part of the project has proven to be a bit more challenging, um, even despite the pandemic, as we have a lot of water pipes and infrastructure buried in and around the raceways. We also have a narrow concrete ledge um, edge to our raceways um, to provide the support for the above ground structure. Um, so we are continuing to work on that. And we definitely hope to get um, some determinations this year. Uh, with that, I'm going to pass it back to Sean. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Uh, thanks a lot. That was great. Um, I, as, as you saw, I, I threw up a poll question there for everybody to see. Um, let me see if I can share those answers. So the question was uh, in regards to our website and which statement below best describes your impression of our, of our new website and redesign. As you can see there, um, the, the largest category is 48%. Uh, they view the new website as a great improvement and I use it regularly, followed by it's average and I use it occasionally. Um, kind of great to see there that, that, that only 2% said, yeah, I don't really like it all. It's not very helpful. So you know, that 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 shows us that you know we're we're providing a service you know for our anglers, um, and and we really hope you you continue to enjoy it, and we're going to continue to upgrade and make modifications. So let me just I'll I'll share another poll at this moment with you, and that one is going to have to do with which format do you prefer these meetings. So the neat thing is I can see the, the results coming in. And the question is, in what format do you prefer future public meetings, such as the Freshwater Fisheries Forum or our annual trout meeting to be held? In person, entirely virtual, a hybrid, or I'm fine either way. So right now I see 38% of the poll is in. Right now hybrid is the, the number one uh, answer. We'll let that poll open for until about 70% of the anglers answer. We tried this mean we tried this during last week and we barely got over 70 percent but I, I see we're right right there at 70 now 71 and as long as the answers are coming in i'm going to keep it open we'll climb to 76 percent of the 162 attendants so we'll close it there at 78 percent and i'll share the answer with you here uh, hybrid, in-person, and virtual there is, is the, uh, the number one answer of 59%. 28% folks happy with entirely virtual. And interestingly, only 4% saying, you know, in-person only is the way to go. So we'll con continue to keep that into consideration uh, moving forward. But yeah, we, we hope to utilize these polls. We hope they're kind of fun and interesting, uh, both for our staff and, and for the angling public. All right, so uh, let's move on. Uh, I have a pre-recorded presentation. Uh, Karen, if you could play that. Good morning. I'm Sean Krause, Bureau Chief for Freshwater Fisheries. Welcome to our annual trout meeting. We have a real nice agenda for you here today where the intention is to provide an opportunity for anglers to interact with our staff here at Fish and Wildlife. So I'm gonna start by giving some freshwater fisheries updates. 
Following my presentation, Ed Conley, the superintendent of the Pequest Trout Hatchery, is going to talk about all things Pequest. After his presentation, you'll have the opportunity to ask some questions. Next will be Maria Berezin Dowling, our trout stocking coordinator. She's going to go over trout stocking allocations and what the 2023 season is going to look like. Following her presentation, you can ask her some questions as well. After this, we're going to open the floor to a trout stocking program discussion in which we're going to look for feedback from anglers to see what part of our program you really like and what things we could improve upon. This will also be a general question and answer period. Please remember to keep yourself muted during the presentations. This goes for both the public and for staff. There will be plenty of opportunity to ask questions, as we're going to handle questions in two different ways. One would be that you can type your question into a question box. We will have a moderator looking at them, and during the question and answer periods, we will read a few of your questions and answer them to the best of our ability. Secondly, if you're a little bit more bold, you can use the icon here to raise your hand, and then during the question and answer periods, we will call on you, and you can ask your questions verbally, live. For those of you not familiar with GoToWebinar, we put together this little slide. The first arrow here shows you where the hand icon is to raise your hand when you'd like to be called upon. Secondly, there's a question box. Here, please type questions that you would like staff to ask. Don't use this as a chat. Um, we have a lot of important things to discuss. And uh, as we've seen in other meetings, this question box sometimes gets misused and turns into kind of just general chat. Please avoid that. Here at Fish and Wildlife, we're proud of our rich history and longevity managing your fish and wildlife species and their habitats. This slide was recycled from last year with two obvious updates. You can see here that the 130 year banner was modified to show that we have been around for 131 years. In last year's Freshwater Fishing Digest, we wrote an article focusing on the, on the Hackettstown Hatchery, now in our 111th year raising fish. In this year's digest, we wanted to celebrate 40 years of trout production at the Pequest Trout Hatchery. Also within the Bureau of Freshwater Fisheries, we also have a research and management unit. The research and management unit consists of six regional fisheries biologists, one technician, and one wildlife worker. This team is complemented by approximately six hourly employees that are typically recent college graduates with a degree in fisheries science, biology, or a related field. On the map here, you can see how each regional biologist has a jurisdiction that's laid out by watershed. This information can also be found on our website. At the list on the left, you can see the six biologists, each with a watershed and a primary responsibility for general fisheries management. Under that, each has a specific specialty. As you can see, Maria is our new trout stocking coordinator. Eric works with anadromous species and fish passage issues. Scott is our native fishes biologist, and he does a lot of work with water quality and statistics. Justin is our new cool water biologist, working with muskie, walleye, hybrid striped bass, northern pike, etc. And Ross leads our effort to manage wild trout. He also is going to be leading our efforts to manage lake trout and landlocked salmon and he does our GIS mapping. Chris Smith is our warm water biologist, and he is also our invasive species leader. This small team is responsible for the management of freshwater fisheries across the state. And as you can see from the map on the right, they keep themselves quite busy. Each dot represents a fisheries survey that was conducted during 2022. There were 135 surveys conducted across 106 waters. Of these surveys, 100 were on streams and rivers, and 35 on lakes and ponds. And to give an idea of a breakdown of the primary reason for each survey, 80 of them were on trout streams to assess the status of wild brook and brown trout. 24 surveys were to assess warm water fish assemblages. Six surveys were done specifically to monitor the presence and distribution of invasive species, and the remainder for miscellaneous reasons some of which were to study lake trout, hybrid striped bass, 
to assess restoration projects, and to assess native species. Conducting fishery surveys is important to better manage the fisheries resources of the state, and these data are made available to the public. On our website, we compile these data and put them into annual reports. Survey data and write-ups include location, water quality and habitat information, species composition, a summary of what we found, recommendations, and once again, these information can be found in our annual research and management reports found under the Bureau of Freshwater Fisheries highlights on our website. In addition to surveying fish populations, our biologists are heavily engaged in partnerships with both external stakeholders and internally within the agency. I don't have time to list the great array of partnerships here, but I just wanted to mention a few. We work closely with the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture, the New Jersey Statewide Dam Removal Partnership, and the Mid-Atlantic Panel of Aquatic Invasive Species, just to name a few. But internally, our fisheries staff work closely with nearly every facet of fish and wildlife. We have great gratitude for our relationship with land management, information education, law enforcement, our endangered non-game species program, all of which we work hand in hand to accomplish the many goals of our agency. So that concludes my brief presentation. As mentioned, we are very proud of the work we do at Fish and Wildlife and what we accomplish for anglers in New Jersey. And please use this meeting as an opportunity, not only to let us know what we do well, but also to let us know things that you would like us to consider or things you'd like us to work on. Thanks a lot and I hope you have a great meeting. Next is our hatchery superintendent of the Pequest Trout Hatchery, Ed Conley. Welcome to the production portion of the Pequest Trout Hatchery 2023 Virtual Trout Meeting. My name is Ed Conley and I am the Pequest Trout Hatchery Superintendent. Today I will be going over hatchery updates, 2022 production, and 2023 projections for the Spring Trout Stocking Program. I would like to bring to everybody's attention that the Pequest Trout Hatchery is celebrating 40 years of trout production this year. The hatchery was completed in 1982 and the first fish went out the door in 1983. The hatchery wasn't into complete full production until 1986. This article can be found in the 2023 New Jersey Freshwater Fishing Digest this year. This article contains information about the facility, biosecurity, the 
the rainbow trout production cycle, and the three stocking programs, spring, fall, and winter. Jumping into updates, in 2022, PQuest staff did a couple of corporate business tax maintenance funded projects on raceway lines A, F, G, and H. These projects consisted of replacing all the relief joint caulking on those raceway lines. All of the caulking is now 40 years old and most of it is deteriorated and or missing. Replacing the caulking will help stop water seeping from the raceways and will have a great benefit to the hatchery's water flows. The cost of these two projects total $28,551.04. This money is given to us in addition to our regular hatchery budget. The B, C, D, and I lines will need to be completed over the next few years due to the short window when these raceway lines are emptied to accomplish this task. Other updates, this past fall, 1.5 million eggs were taken from 569 three-year-old female rainbow trout that will be used for the 2024 stocking seasons. Eggs started being taken on August 30th and ended on October 26th. Eggs take about 32 days to hatch. Trout will undergo monthly growth analysis until they are stocked. Weights and lengths will be taken monthly to ensure the proper size for each stocking program. Disinfection procedures are a priority at the hatchery, as you can see the different methods on this slide. Watch about to the left, uh, there are eggs being dipped in iodine for 10 minutes to ensure there is no bacteria or fungus on them. As you can see, the equipment is also dipped in iodine. And then we have floor baths in the nursery. And also we power wash and use aquatic safe disinfection on the raceway lines. Predatory deterrents are also in place at the hatchery to deter avian predators from bringing in disease. As you can see to the left, there are mylar ribbons and overhead lines over the raceways. We employ scary men. We also employ propane cannons and scare crackers on the raceways as well as electric fence around the perimeter. Jumping into 2022 production numbers, the Spring Rainbow Trout Program saw 583,990 production fish averaging 11.3 inches. These fish were stocked along with 7,520 breeders measuring up to 26 inches. The total fish for the spring production was 591,510 fish, weighing in at just under 306,000 pounds. The 2022 Fall Rainbow Trout Program saw 20,780 two-year-old Rainbow trout averaging 14.6 inches that were stocked along with 933 year old rainbow trout breeders at an 18.8 inch average length. The total for the fall was 21,710 fish weighing in at just a little over 31,000 pounds. The 2022 Winter Rainbow Trout program saw 4,460 fish at an average length of 14.8 inches being stocked. They weighed in at 7,294 pounds. A grand total of 617,680 trout were stocked in 2022. PQuest hatchery staff met and exceeded goals for the year. These fish weighed in about 
344,269 pounds. Getting into 2023 projections for the spring trout stocking season, we are looking at stocking 184,000 trout during the first three weeks of preseason. And then in season, weeks one through seven, we're looking at stocking another 386,000 fish. We are on goal to meet or exceed our 570,000 baseline. Fish are currently at a 10 and a half inch average and weigh about a half a pound a piece. And those fish will be stocked along with two year old and three year old brood stock. I wanted to remind you about our hook a winner program. New Jersey Fish and Wildlife will be jaw tagging more than a thousand rainbow trout for release in the New Jersey waters. These tag trout will be stocked pre-season to be available for opening day of fishing. For more information, visit the website on the screen. If you are a lucky angler who lands one of these fish, send your name, address, fish tag number. Please do not send the actual tag because it will rip the envelope. And location to catch to Pequest Trout Hatchery, 605 Pequest Road, Oxford, New Jersey 07863 Attention Hook a Winner Program. In recognition of your catch, a certificate and award patch will be mailed to you. During the 2022 season, we saw 124 tag returns. Preseason stocking will begin on March 20th, 2023. These trucks will be rolling out to your favorite spots. Please do not forget to buy your 2023 fishing license and trout stamp. Fishing licenses and trout stamps can be purchased online at the website on the screen or at your local agent. Please see page 12 of the digest and see if you qualify for a buddy license that may save you almost 50%. Opening day this year will be April 8th. All your favorite locations should be stocked and ready to go. This concludes the production portion of the 2023 trout meeting. As always, good luck in your angling adventures. Thanks a lot, Ed, that was great. Um, so at this point, we're gonna open up the floor to some questions for, for Best production there with Ed Conley. Uh, so Ed, if you could turn your camera and microphone on, that would be great. As we get set up, uh, I just wanna introduce a couple more poll questions just to get us moving and also to address some questions coming up in the question box. So um, as Lisa mentioned, you know, what we, we are working and making some progress to cover the raceways, which is a first step to bringing back brown trout. So, you know, we know that the brown trout is a, a major issue for anglers and it's a major issue for us, us as well. Um, we don't have any intention of remaining a rainbow trout only hatchery. We are looking to diversify that. And as of right now, brown trout are at the top of that list. So um, as to not take too much oxygen out of the room with the brown trout question, um, we, yes, we are interested in bringing them back. Um, we just have to make sure that we uh, do it in the, in the most appropriate way. Um, one thing that concerns staff and including myself is that if we were to have a major outbreak again, um, the, the, the overall number of trout that you would have uh, you know, stocked as an angler could, could be sacrificed. Um, if we were to have a major outbreak, we might be put in a position again where you know, fish might have to be uh, euthanized and it might really uh, might really compromise the overall product, uh, especially if we're talking about 570,000 uh, trout in the spring. So just rest assured that we're also interested in diversifying the trout program. Um, let me jump into a poll question here for everybody. Give me a moment to get it set up. So let me launch this question here in regards to size of trout. And the question is, would you be interested in 
a larger average fish, but realize that the baseline of 570,000 trout would have to be reduced. So right now the program consists of 10 and a half inch average fish in the spring and 570,000 baseline. So once again, this question right now, I have 30% voted, but let me explain it again. I reiterate it. Would you be interested in a larger average fish? Now we're not talking about, you know, 14, 15, 16 inches in the spring. We're talking about possibly bulking up uh, a 10 and a half inch average to something more like, you know, 11 and 12. Um, but knowing that, you know, because the hatchery is based on uh, biomass, oxygen, temperature, uh, feed, all a lot of variables, we couldn't possibly raise larger fish and still maintain 700, uh, 570,000 baseline. So Manus is really split down the middle. Uh, right now we have 72% of the vote in, 74% going once, going twice. Let's close that poll and share it. So would you be interested in a larger average fish? 47% uh, of the anglers are saying uh, yes at this point, 45% no, 8% not sure. That's about as right down the middle as you could, as you could possibly imagine. Secondly, let me let me launch. Um, actually, no, we already answered. We already asked that question. Let's open it up to uh, the question box. So uh, let me ask Ross if you have any questions in that question box. Um, you know, for Ed or myself in regards to uh, hatchery production at Peak West. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, there is there is one question in the question uh, box that's um, about a tranquilizer or sedative agent added to the water in the trout stocking trucks. Uh, Ed, uh, would you like to uh, address that? Uh, basically, we do not use a sedative on a trout truck. Uh, basically, the fish are not are taken off feed a day before they go in the trout stock. So they uh, don't create waste in there, uh, dropping oxygen, but there is no sedative used on the trout trucks. Uh, oxygen is injected into the tanks. Thanks, Ed. Um, I do have another one that maybe Ed, you could also uh, answer. And it, it basically has to do with uh, why do some of the trout have white meat and others have orange meat? Um, I, and I've thrown it to you because I know it has to do with the feed. Uh, if you want to address how you have changed the feed over the last couple of years. Uh, basically, we have added asked the xanthan to our finish feeds, and that gives the fish uh, more of a pinkish color or orange color. And uh, what's called basically, it's a, a just the additive, and it also is beneficial, you know, has antioxidant properties. Uh, basically, some of the fish that you're probably finding might have been in the river longer, could be more pale, but, uh, you know, most of the fish going out the door here have a nice color to them. Um, if I could jump in and answer a question, it's in the question box here. Uh, the question is, please address concerns anglers have regarding PFAS, other environmental contaminants, and how these issues may affect the usability of fish. So, uh, for those of you who don't know, there's a, a group of chemicals. Uh, the acronym is PFAS. There are chemicals used in industry, and um, they've often been called legacy uh, chemicals. Um, we have had uh, testing of the, the trout at the Peak West Trout Hatchery. Um, they've tested essentially clean or negative for PFAS, indicating that they're not accumulating those chemicals in our hatchery system. Um, we do, do know a little bit that uh, existing PFAS in the environment can bioaccumulate in fish tissue. And there are currently um, studies underway in, in the state of New Jersey and elsewhere that are looking into that. Uh, PFAS can bioaccumulate in fish and then can also be found in, in human tissue as well. So uh, DEP, uh, Division of Science and Research, is, is currently uh, investigating this as we speak. Um, let me ask Eric. Eric, do you have any? Do you see any hands up uh, for any 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 participants who would like to verbally ask a question? 
Yeah, hi, Sean. I have one hand raised from Robert McIntosh. So I will go ahead and unmute you, Robert, and you can ask your question. Hello. Uh, yeah, I'm kind of dissatisfied with the way the uh, restoration of the hatchery has been uh, been undertaken. It's been 10 years now. It was fall of 2013 when the outbreak occurred. And that's a very long time. I don't. I hope we don't have to wait another 10 years. But I, I put a sample uh Poll, a couple of sample poll questions in the uh, in the question and answer box, uh, and uh, I, I think that they might be interesting to ask to assess the uh, um, angler interest in uh, in what can be done in terms of once the uh, restoration is completed, what what kind of trout should be raised. Uh, you can refer to that in the question box. Uh, I guess would you like me to state it verbally? Well, I mean, I so we were considering putting that in there, um, but I just want to kind of get ahead of it for you, if I may. And um, we too are dissatisfied with with only raising rainbow trout. Um, since the outbreak of frankulosis, we have felt as if it's been the best strategy to ensure you know consistent product to anglers being rainbow trout only. Um, the, the qu question you posed about you know would you have, rather have browns or, or brook trout? At this point in time, I can tell you that we don't have any intention of bringing brook trout back into our hatchery system. Um, Eastern brook trout are a, a species of greatest conservation need um, throughout its native range from Georgia to Maine. And um, the, the notion of, of stocking, uh, stocking the brook trout um, is, is not as desirable to us as, as, as brown trout is. Um, we are not interested in, 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 in raising uh, brook trout at Pequest to be stocked, to, you know, to, to co-mingle and possibly interbreed with our wild stocks. Um, biologists understand that, that native genetic diversity is important and the idea of uh, potentially introducing like, you know, hatchery genes essentially into wild brook trout populations is, is considered unacceptable at this point. So we just, you know, we, we, we do hear from a lot of anglers um, about dissatisfaction in a rainbow trout only program, um, and we are well aware of that. Well, I think the first two questions might reinforce that dissatisfaction, and it's something that you could use to communicate to management. That's why I, that's why I pose the questions. I'd like to see what, what the people in this um, trout meeting think about it. Okay, um, I will I will certainly address that with the poll question uh, because it was more spontaneous. We don't have it typed in. So Thank if you. you are if you are dissatisfied with rainbow trout only, go ahead and click yes. If you're dissatisfied, click yes. If you are satisfied with rainbow trout only, click no. And we have 65% of the vote in, 71% of the vote, 73 going once. Going twice, 75% of the vote is in, um, and it appears that 50% of the anglers on this call, and right now we're at 182, 50% uh, are uh, dissatisfied with rainbow trout only, and 36 are satisfied with rainbow trout only, 15 not sure. Um, one thing to emphasize, and I was going to do this later in the meeting, is that we will be um, we're interested, we're very interested, and this is the reason we're having these meetings to hear from the public. So um, I want to, you know, reiterate something I mentioned to, to, to folks in the past, is that we are intending to launch uh, a trout angler survey. Um, there's a lot of details to be worked out, as you know, with, with any project, but we are looking to launch a, an online survey intended to go out to trout stamp buyers of New Jersey, and we're looking to find out what you like about the trout stocking program and what you're not satisfied with, um, possible recommendations. And we will get to that later in the meeting as well. But we're going to use this meeting as just a sounding board to see kind of where anglers are at. That'll help us uh, redefine and address more specific questions. So, you know, this right here, these are, you know, unscientific polls. We know that it's only, you know, 182 people compared to the, the masses that, that purchase trout stamps. So stay tuned for a, an online, uh, probably email survey going out to anglers uh, intended to go out in, in the month of June at the conclusion of our trout season. Um, 
Uh, Eric, do you see any more hands raised? Currently, no. Oh, yes, there's one more just popped up from Stephen Keith Jr. I will unmute you and you can ask your question. Stephen, yeah, you're unmuted now, so go ahead. Okay, you can hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, well, I, uh, first I want to start off thanking everyone for this um, online. I was on the uh, fishing last week and um, <clears throat> You guys do a great job. You're never going to make everyone happy. We know that. And listen, I understand you can't get the Brooks and the Browns right now, and that's fine. And I'm ha I'm more than happy with just rainbows. So I just want to say thank you guys for everything. Um, I had a question about, like, the wild, like, the, the, the little extremes. Like, I live in Randolph, so we have the Millbrook. Um, right there, and then we have the up in Mendham, then we have the uh, um, upper uh, Whippany River. Is there ever thoughts of like maybe like stocking some little rainbows or anything in those wild trout streams just to like maybe up the numbers of the wild trout that'd be in there? Yeah, Ross, would you like to take a shot of that or would you like me to handle it? I'll take a shot at it. Um, I'm sorry, uh, Stephen, I think was, was who asked the question. Stephen, um, at this time, no, um, that's not something that we would be interested in doing. Um, you know, the point of keeping those streams uh, genetically isolated from uh, hatchery stock uh, is important. Um, you know, the wild fisheries, in some cases, they, they the small streams can create enough um, biomass that makes it very good fishing. Um, in some streams, uh, there's not enough to make it, you know, attractive to anglers, but it's still uh, very important to keep those uh, wild genetics separate uh, from the hatchery genetics. And also, when, whenever you introduce other uh, species or other individuals to a stream, they can outcompete uh, some of the, the native fish that are in there or the wild fish that are in there. And they can also bring different disease and things. And those are just risks that, uh, that not, we're not going to be taking. Okay, uh, thanks, Ross. Uh, thanks, Eric, for keeping an eye on the question box. Um, this is going to conclude the first open question and answer period. Uh, so thanks, everybody. We hear a lot of good ideas. A lot of it's great to have that interaction. Um, next, I'd like to introduce uh, Maria Perez and Dowling. She's going to give a presentation on the trout allocations, how, where, and why we put we stock uh, certain species of trout. Good morning, my name is Maria Berez and Dowling. I am here today to talk to you about our spring 2023 trout stocking program. I'm going to go over updates and changes to the program. I'm going to briefly discuss how we determine our trout allocations each year. I am also going to talk about how the season will be run and kind of give a brief history of how things have been run over the past few years, given the COVID-19 pandemic. This spring, we will be stocking a total of 175 water bodies, 90 of which will be streams, and 85 of those 175 water bodies are lakes and ponds throughout the state. We will be stocking a total of 570,000 trout throughout our spring trout stocking season, all of which are raised right here at our Pequest Trout Hatchery. Our trout stocking program would not be possible if it were not for the collaborative efforts of all of the individuals listed here, from the freshwater fisheries biologists to the conservation officers that enforce the, fresh, the freshwater fishing regulations that help us with signage, um, that help kind of be our eyes and ears on the ground in a lot of situations, to the stocking crews, which encompasses both hatchery staff and lands management staff, to the Fish and Game Council, who helps us to propose and adopt different regulations, including those regarding trout stocking, and the public. Um, this program is run for the public, so your input, your thoughts, and feelings about the program are very valuable to us. So I will just get right into our stocking plan. So if you were at the Fish and Game Council meeting a few weeks ago, you may have heard our Bureau Chief Sean Krause mention that we will be running a what we refer to as a normal season with a normal set of regulations. That is a seven-week in-season period which is preceded by a three-week preseason period. 
I just want to take a few minutes to go over some of the changes that our trout stocking program has undergone between 2019 and now as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So if you look at the left column in this table, you will see what we have listed as our normal trout season under normal regulations. And the last time we were able to run a trout season like that was 2019 prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. So you'll notice that the total number of trout going out never changed, even through the pandemic. Um, however, most of the program did see a pretty big change. So looking at that normal column, we can see that in 2019, during our last normal year, we had our typical three week preseason with 184,000 trout going out during preseason. We had those preseason closures during that three week period where trout stocked water bodies are closed to fishing for that period until the morning of opening day. We also had our typical seven weeks of in-season trout stocking with 386,000 fish going out during the season. We had in-season closures on 14 water bodies, which again is one of our normal regulations. Um, if you are interested in seeing which water bodies are included in those in-season closures, you can see our Freshwater Fishing Digest. Those 14 water bodies are closed in season on the day that they're being stocked until 5 p.m. We also, in a normal year, run our bonus brood stock program, which I will discuss a little bit later. And we utilize volunteers to help with various aspects of our trout stocking program. Now, if you look at the pandemic years, those first two years of the pandemic, 2020 and 2021, things were very, very heavily altered. So we completely altered how we run the season. Rather than that three weeks of preseason stocking with seven weeks of in-season stocking, we ran four weeks of preseason stocking. And during those four weeks, nearly all of the trout went out. 500,000 of that 570,000 went out during those four weeks of preseason stocking. We also held a catch and release period starting April 1st prior to opening day to kind of allow people to get out there and fish for trout, um, maybe at a time where there would be less people out, where they wouldn't experience crowds so much. Maybe this would also help uh, kind of break down some of those crowds that we see on opening day. Now, we love to see those crowds on opening day during a normal year, but during the pandemic, we did have, you know, some concerns about spreading and exposure. Um, during those two pandemic years, we also did not have any in-season closures. We only had one week of in-season stocking to begin with. Uh, we also didn't run our bonus brood stock program. Um, many, many water bodies were closed to the public, and we also didn't want to start encouraging people to kind of gather in large groups at certain water bodies. We also were unable to use volunteers during those years just because we wanted to limit everyone's exposure. Now, if we move forward to 2022 or last year, we did start to move back towards a normal season. We went back to three weeks of preseason stocking, seven weeks of in-season stocking. We went back to that preseason closure period and got rid of that catch and release period. We reinstated those 14 in-season closures. We reinstated our bonus brood stock program. We were not able to reinstate the use of volunteers. Um, the biggest difference that you'll see, in addition to the fact that we weren't using volunteers, is that we put out a lot more trout than normal during that preseason period. So the goal there was to just kind of clear the raceways quicker so that if there was a COVID-19 outbreak among staff, it would still be possible to get all of those fish out of the raceways, out of the hatcheries and into the streams and lakes for all of you. Now, 2023, we are back to a completely normal regulation set, completely normal season, completely normal preseason, and for the first time since before the pandemic, we will be utilizing volunteers to help with trout stocking. So we are very, very, very excited at that opportunity. I can't talk about the trout stocking program without at least mentioning our trout allocation methodology or what goes into determining how many trout are stocked at each location. Now, there are a set of physical, biological, and social factors that go into determining how many trout are stocked in streams and rivers compared with lakes and ponds. The physical factors that are taken into account for streams and rivers include things like the flow or size of the stream in cubic feet per second and the length of the stocking influence. The physical factor that's primarily taken into account for lakes and ponds is the surface area of the water body or the size of the water body in acres. 
The biological factors that we consider for lakes and ponds are pretty much the same as those for streams and rivers. We look to see if the water body can support trout year round or for just part of the year. Or in other words, is this a seasonal or a year round trout fishery? The social factors that go into determining trout allocation for streams and rivers include things like land ownership. Is it public land? Is it private land? Is there public access to the stream? Um, is there parking available for, ang for anglers? Do anglers like to fish here? Um, the social factors that go into determining trout allocation for lakes and ponds includes things like population density, how many people live in the municipalities adjacent to the lake, is there good angler access, is there an open shoreline to fish from, is there a way to get a boat into the water body, um, and the last social factor that we really take into account for lakes and ponds is are there other trout stocked opportunities nearby. We do like to give trout stocked opportunities to areas that may not have them otherwise. This is just a screenshot of our trout allocation database. This is the program that we use to run the allocations that helps us determine how many trout are stocked into each water body. I will now go over the changes to the trout stocking program for individual water bodies for the spring of 2023. The first update that you'll see is the suspension of stocking at Mill Pond in Bergen County. Uh, Mill Pond will not be stocked this spring due to issues with increased sedimentation from storms over the last few years. Next change that you'll see is to Tenefkill Creek in Bergen County. On this stream, one new stocking point was added and two were dropped. In addition, the total stock stream mileage was recalculated more accurately using GIS mapping software. The stocking mileage increased from 1.5 miles to 2 miles, which resulted in an additional 170 fish for this water body in the spring of 2023. Our next change is to Hackyhohacky Creek in Hunterdon County. One stocking point was dropped from the stream, which resulted in a mileage reduction from 3.3 miles to 2.9 miles. This mileage reduction will result in a decrease of 170 trout for this stream in spring 2023. Our next update is to Ken Lockwood Gorge in Hunterdon County. The access road through the gorge has not been maintained after several damaging storm events. Vehicle access is currently restricted to the two outer parking lots. Anglers may still park at either end of the gorge to access the entire stretch on foot and there has been no change to the total number of trout being stocked in this area. We also have a change to the South Branch Raritan River in Hunterdon County. One stocking point was dropped from this stream. Additionally, the total stock stream mileage was recalculated using GIS mapping software. Both of these changes resulted in a mileage decrease from 20.1 miles to 18.7 miles and a decrease of 2,550 fish for the spring of 2023. On the lower stretch of the Wanakew River in Passaic County, one new stocking point was added and total stock stream mileage was recalculated using GIS mapping software. Both of these changes resulted in an increase in mileage from 1.2 miles to 1.7 miles and an additional 780 fish. We also have some changes to the Big Flat Brook on the section that is located below Steam Mill Bridge in Sussex County. Multiple stocking points were dropped due to a landslide that occurred on National Park Service Road Route 615 and due to the closure of the property at the School of Conservation. I should add, however, that we will continue to stock directly above and directly below the landslide. The Total stock stream mileage was also recalculated using GIS mapping software. The combination of these things resulted in a reduction of mileage from 13.9 miles to 11.9 miles and will result in 3,830 less fish for the spring of 2023. For Blair Creek in Warren County, the total stock stream mileage was recalculated using GIS mapping software which resulted in a reduction of mileage from 1.3 miles to 1.15 and a reduction of 150 fish for spring 2023. On the Pollenskill River in Warren County, we added one new stocking point at the Columbia Wildlife Management Area, which will be stocked both above and below Route 80. This new stocking point resulted in a mileage increase from 10.9 to 11.9 miles 
and will result in an additional 2,500 fish. The next thing that I'd like to talk about is our bonus broodstock program. This is a program where 10 lakes are selected each spring to receive an additional 30 to 50 large fish or broodstock per water body. Now, the list of 10 water bodies changes every year. So if you don't see a water body near you or if you don't see a water body that you like to fish on this list, that does not mean that it will not be included in the program in the future. Here is a map and our list of the 2023 spring trout stocking bonus broodstock water bodies. We have Amwell Lake, Barber's Pond, Echo Lake, Jampetro Park Pond, Heritage Park Pond, Nomahegan Park Lake, North Hudson Park Lake, Oldham Pond, Ponder Lodge Pond, and Sylvan Lake. I just want to direct your attention now to a few places on our website where you will be able to find our 2023 spring trout information. So you will be able to find on njfishandwildlife.com if you go to freshwater fishing and trout stocking and spring trout. Um, on our spring trout stocking webpage, there is a link to the 2023 spring trout allocations. Um, that list can be seen here. It includes all of the water bodies that we are stocking, the number of trout that are going out during preseason stocking, the number of trout that are going out every week during in-season, and which day of the week that is happening. In addition to that document, you can also find a list of fishing access locations on trout stocked waters by county here, and listed in alphabetical order here. Both of these links are found once again on our trout stocking page of our website. We also have a new number for our, tr our trout stocking hotline. That new number is 609-322-9524. Uh, you can also subscribe to our email lists. You can also follow us on social media. These are all great ways to stay up to date on what is happening with trout stocking as well as other programs within freshwater fisheries. You can also scan the QR code that is located on all of our trout stocked water signs, and that will get you information on trout stocked waters as well. You can get that directly on your cell phone. And with that, I would like to end my presentation. I'd like to thank you all for listening today, and please let us know if you have any questions. All right. Great job, Maria. Uh, love the information, love the enthusiasm. So if you could, if Maria is going to uh, turn on her camera and unmute herself. Um, at this point, I would like to open up the floor for any anglers that have specific questions regarding information that Maria provided in her presentation. Um, there's going to be a general Q&A session at the end that we're going to uh, finish up the day with. But before we get to that, once again, if anybody has any questions specifically for Maria in regards to the trout program, information she just provided, the allocations, um, please raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, there may be questions in the question box, so I'm going to have uh, Ross and Eric take a look at those two areas as they get moving. As staff prepares, I did want to address two questions that I saw in the question box. One, had to, one was real quick. An angler asked if uh, uh, being over 70 years old, if you needed a trout stand. The qualifier there is if you're a resident of New Jersey and you're over 70, you get the free license and you do not need a trout stand. Second question that I'd like to address, I saw a couple times, had to do with uh, uh, diversity, a diverse, diversification of the Pequest trout hatchery in regards to golden rainbow trout. Um, just earlier this week, uh, I had a conversation with some staff and we were discussing uh, that this, this is something that we should explore. Um, we are familiar with Pennsylvania's program. So yeah, the, the notion of stocking golden rainbow trout is something we have to look into. Um, the hatchery is a fine-tuned operation and with everything gained, you know, there's always something lost and there's always considerations that have to be taken into account. 
Um, from a diversity standpoint, I understand very well um, that, that the golden rainbows are, are interesting. Um, I too, I fish both New Jersey and Pennsylvania waters. And I can tell you that when we go to Pennsylvania and my kids see a golden trout in the water, that's the fish that they're casting for. So we do understand that, that, that diversity does add an intriguing, interesting part of fishing. So uh, with that, Ross, do you have any questions in the question box that you would like to elevate for Maria or anybody else of our staff? Uh, yeah, sure, Sean. They're uh, coming in uh, pretty consistently here. Um, so let me try to keep up. So there's a question here um, from uh, Dennis Mahanachek. Uh, he asked, are all the stock waters posted? Uh, he mentions about the pump and river um, and the stocking signs haven't been replaced in a few years. Um, Maria, I think you look ready to answer that question. Yes, sure. So um, we do our best to get out there and make sure that all of our stocked waters are posted. Um, however, those signs are posted generally by our conservation police officers who are pretty limited in staffing. So they do their best to get out there and get every single you know, water body reposted at all of those you know, stocking points. Um, but sometimes it kind of just takes a little longer just because we don't have enough boots on the ground um, to kind of cover every single stocking point throughout the entire state, but they do their best to try to get out there and replace those signs every single season. Uh, we had new signs out this year. Um, so it's kind of just a matter of, of manpower. <laughs> and, and if I could add on to that too, um, th there's often a misconception amongst anglers that every trout stocking point has a sign on it. That's, that's just not accurate. Um, the, the, the places that get posted are generally um, the places that have the best angler access. Um, but that's not always the case. So just to reiterate, not every trout stocking point has a sign at it. And I just, uh, real quick, I did see a couple of questions and comments in here about the fact that we seem to be stocking um, less fish because, you know, we kind of mentioned that there are some decreases at certain stocking points. I do want to point out that we still stock our baseline number of 570,000 trout. Um, in any areas where you see a decrease in trout, those trout are sort of reallocated to other stocking locations. So if you see something that says, you know, oh, we're stocking 3,000 less fish in this particular water body, those 3,000 fish aren't taken out of the program. They're just redistributed elsewhere throughout the state. Sean, there's also a question here from a Bill Growling um, uh, asking about broodstock going into rivers or just the lakes mentioned. Um, I'll, I'll handle that. So, um, Bill. Okay. Um, what Maria presented in her presentation is our bonus brood stock program. So those are um, water bodies that we select every year. Um, usually it's between nine or ten water bodies. Uh, the program consists of typically small ponds where we know uh, those fish are going to be caught pr preferably on opening day when there's a lot of anglers out there. Um, and that, that can be, you know, those fish can be seen being caught to try to increase uh, the excitability on those waters. Um, you know, there are also waters that we select uh, that are in high population density areas. That's why I think I saw a comment about, uh, you know, nothing in, I think it was Western Morris County. Um, you know, so we, we try to pick those bonus broodstock waters for those reasons. Um, but have no fear, bonus broodstock do go out in just about all of our waters at about 2% of the load until stocks run out. So that that means pre-season, um, you know, if your water body that you're interested in gets, uh, say, you know, 4,000 fish, you know, roughly 2% of that number will be uh, brood stock, and that will go out definitely pre-season. Um, I believe we usually have uh, brood stock still available at least till week two, um, probably even longer than that, but uh, it, that does change from year to year. Um, so just to clarify that all the water bodies or just about all water bodies will receive brood stock. Um, There's also um, a couple of questions uh, um, that I can uh, that I can address unless Sean. I mean, is this is this still you still want this uh, related to Maria's? Yeah, let's at, at this point let's just keep it uh, tight to to topics such as allocation, um, why is something stocked, why it's not stocked, and that goes for any anglers that might have their their hands raised at this point. Let's just limit it to those questions. And I assure you that we're going to we're going to open it up wide open uh, at the end of the meeting. Um, while we're um, looking at that, Eric, do you have do you see any hands up? 
Yeah, hi, Sean. There are several people with hands up. I will just start at the top of the list. So, John Sealing, I will unmute you and you can ask your question verbally. You are unmuted, John. Hi, how are you guys? All right, my Great. quick question is, has the stocking gone down in central Jersey? It just seems like the stocking along the Brereton River that goes along the canal, um, it just seems like there's less trout and there's less people fishing there over the last few years. Yeah, I mean, I could mention, um, so I'm not sure if you're talking, you know, specific points on a point by point basis, but like overall, I mean, there, there hasn't been a concerted effort to, to decrease, you know, trout stocking in that area. Um, there have been, you know, issues on, on certain stocking points on a case by case basis maybe a private landowner. And that's that's something just to address as like a bigger picture issue. Um, you know, at times, you know, we, we do stock some private properties with the grace of the, the, the landowner um, allowing and not restricting any angler access. If we hear that a, a private landowner begins to restrict access, we'll pull it from the program because that's just not fair and that's not the intention. And then at times there's there's anglers who are property owners who maybe they've had their, their property open for 20 years or more. and um, they do get, you know, they do get disappointed in, you know, people maybe parking there, partying, um, littering, um, or maybe just a lot of quantity of people there. So, yeah, the, the, the trout program is dynamic in that fashion. When we hear from our conservation police officers or lands management or from anglers or property owners, points come and go and, they and, and they're in flux. Um, so I guess the take home message is, um, I really want to encourage anglers to be to, to continue to be courteous. Um, don't litter, don't be loud, um, you know, don't park on lawns and things of that nature. I'm 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 talking about the canal that that's the state park. It goes from Titusville to New Hope or to Lambertville. It just seems like it's all open access. It's all state park, and it, there's over the years I've noticed less and less people fishing and less and less people catching fish, and I'm one of them. I've fished there since. I've been 30 years old. Yeah, um, I, I, it just seems, I can seems say, less and less. Yeah, I, I'd have to take a deeper dive, but I can I can tell you, for at least the last 10 years or more, maybe 15 years or more, I don't think we've really added or subtracted points on there. So um, I think what you see might be a reflection upon less angling interest in those areas. There's less um, angling also because of Stony Brook. It just doesn't have the water that it used to have, and I'm sure that you don't stock that as well. But it just seems like if you could stock more places in central Jersey, it just seems like all the stocking is made basically up in North Jersey. I mean, I understand that's where all the streams are and the large lakes. And um, I just think that it would be, you know, helpful if central Jersey received more, more stocking. That's all. Thanks. We'll take a look at that. And thanks for the question and comment. Right. Thank you. Um, let's at this point, let me let me throw a poll question up there. Um, this is going to be a, a poll question here um, regarding a potential youth fishing day program. So here, here's a question for you. It's a little long, so it didn't fit within the, the actual poll. So I'm going to read this to you here on the slide. Would you be in favor of a youth fishing day in which only kids under the age of 16 can fish? The youth fishing day might be for a four hour period from 8 a.m. until noon on a Saturday, two or three weeks after opening day. Take a look at that question. Um, we know other, other states have programs similar to this. Um, we certainly don't have any details worked out. We just wanted to gauge interest to see if this is something that anglers might be interested in. So there's the question. It's gonna be um, shortened a bit when I go to launch it for the answers. Your answers uh, would be, no, I'm not interested in, in something like that. Uh, yes, let's do it statewide. Uh, or yes, let's do it on select waters, possibly with a higher stocking rate associated with, with um, that, those waters. And your final choice is not sure. So right now I see 52% of the vote is in. Most people are saying, uh, yes, you know, I, I combine it and it's overwhelming majority. People seem to like this idea. Um, we're at 64 percent of the poll open we're at 66. i like to see it hit 70 before i close it we're at 70 percent going once going twice get your final votes in and we will close it here at 74 percent and here's your answer um 
the number one answer is yes, uh, do it, but do it on select waters, possibly at the higher stocking rate, that's 44%. Yes, do it statewide, 36%, and 18 saying no, don't do it. And at this point, uh, I would like to transition to the, um, what we'll call the, the general public question answer period. Um, it's now 1119. Um, what I'll ask to do is I will ask staff to turn their cameras on. And we're going to continue to address questions in the question box. We're going to continue to field questions in which hands are raised. And we're going to throw some additional poll questions up there. So um, we'll start out with some general questions here you know, for everybody. Um, Ross, do you have anything uh, queued up in the question box? Uh, yeah, there's a couple okay. questions that I can answer here. Um, so one, uh, you know, first off, uh, John Lapari has sent in a, a few questions. And uh, uh, one of his questions is about, um, I, I believe he's, he's referring to the catch and release area. Um, and that it has uh, that we allow single hooks uh, with spinning rods, and he's asking, or, or he wanted to mention that he's hoping to just go to a, I guess, a fly only, um, and and not allow the spinning rod. So um, a few years back, we had a uh, poll, um, an angler survey on that question, and we got our results back, and and it's kind of a split situation there, John. Um, we also did some research on the amount of mortality due to the different situations with bait and uh, artificial only and fly fishing and stuff. So um, the, those results showed that, you know, although there are mortality with bait, um, it was it was at a rarer level or lesser level um, than certainly what the, most people believe. And there was really no difference between um, spinning rods and fly fishing on that. So, so the answer is no. We're not uh, we're not currently um, entertaining any ideas of going to just a fly fishing only section. Um, there's another question it was about I think it was about Columbia Lake. I'm, there's so many questions here. I'm trying to find them all. Um, Columbia Lake, just to reiterate, is is a wildlife management area. Um, it's a Columbia wildlife management area. Um, you know the lake itself is gone the dam has been removed and the area is now open to the public um, and we will be stocking it several locations uh, both above and below route 80 so i encourage anglers to go out there um, and take advantage of that new uh, section of stream on the pollen skill there's a few questions here about golden trout um, sean i think you said you would take those if you could Yeah, Ross, I, I did address that earlier in the meeting. Okay, sorry. It's hard to keep yep. up with everything. You may have been a question deep there in the question box, but I, I did mention the golden trout. Okay. Um, Maria, there's several questions. I, I think you can see that uh, I've identified for you if you want to grab one of those. Well, I, I'll jump in then on a question. Well, I, I believe Murray. Sorry, I didn't muted. realize I was muted. Um, <laughs> uh, I muted myself for a second there. Yeah, so I just kind of wanted to say I, I did see several questions um, regarding opportunities to volunteer with trout stocking. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation during the pandemic year, so during the last three years, we were not able to utilize volunteers. Um, however, we are going back to the use of volunteers. Um, we do get a lot of assistance from like Trout Unlimited and groups like that. Um, if you did have an interest in, you know, volunteering at one of our already instated um, trout stocking locations, you could reach out to me via email. You could call our Lebanon field office, um, have a conversation, and we could um, see, you know, if there's a spot that would work well for you. Or you could reach out to your local TU chapter and see if they're already assisting. We do have, you know, TU chapters that help on a number of water bodies, including, you know, the Ramapo and the Flatbrook and things like that. Uh, we also had a few questions about um, why we don't have uh, more stocking points or why we aren't putting more fish out on certain water bodies. Um, and I just kind of, I know I did address this in my presentation as well, but I just wanted to say that we we don't 
sort of arbitrarily decide, you know, the Raritan is going to get this many fish and we're going to stock it at this many locations. Um, all of those things are determined by our trout methodology of formula in our database that decides, you know, based upon the number of miles that we're stocking, based upon the flow of the stream, based upon the parking and access, um, we have a formula that generates how many fish will be stocked in those water bodies and determines, um, you know, like which weeks they'll be stocked. Um, so it's not something that we just kind of decide. There is a formula that goes into that so that it is, you know, as fair as possible throughout the entire state. Um, but if there are, you know, we also mentioned that there are, we're going to be holding a, um, an angler survey. So there are a lot of questions that were posed here about changes to the program that are things that we can pose in our angler survey. Um, and when we have our next fish code cycle, we could potentially make some of those updates and changes to the program. Okay. Uh Thanks for those questions. Uh, I'm gonna switch gears once again. Um, I'm gonna bounce back to a couple poll questions. And I just wanna be clear on this. Um, I'm gonna give you a, a, a series of poll questions that are in relation to our trout stocking program. And uh, you know, this is just to get a sense of, of the crowd. So one thing that, that we thought this would be a great idea because if, if you hear from one member of the public, they might be very passionate about a topic, but you know, it, it may or may not you know, capture the consensus of the room or not. And you can see some questions are pretty, um, some, some, some results are very, you know, slam dunk in one direction, others are right on that, on that fine edge. So um, this is the section right here. I'm going to post a couple questions just to kind of gauge interest um, to see if this is something worth, you know, worth our agency considering to see if it's worth putting in our massive uh, survey. So Right now, we're just going to call these poll questions. Um, but we are going to put together a comprehensive survey for trout stamp buyers um, to be implemented hopefully in, in June. So the first question is going to deal with uh, uh, catch and release, early season catch and release. So Karen, if you could put that up, that slide. So during 2020 and 2021, in response to the pandemic, we had a catch and release period prior to opening day. Is this something you think we should consider as a permanent change to the program? Now, we made this choice uh, based on trying to get fish out of the raceways early in case we were to have, you know, a, a human outbreak in the hatchery system. Um, and, and this was kind of the idea of a soft opener, letting people fish prior to the official opening day in which harvest can take place. So once again, during 2020 and 2021, we had a early season catch and release period prior to opening day. Is this something you think we should consider moving forward? So here's the condensed question with four answers. So as of this point, 36% of people have voted, 52%, 56%. Right now the leader is no. Um, as an independent question, when you add the two yeses together, that number does seem to topple it but it's very close. Uh, we're at 75%, 76%. We're getting some good returns on this question. 78% uh, going once, going twice. The poll is now closed and I will share with you the results. Um, as of right now, 45% say no. Uh, we do not want to see a preseason uh, catch and release period. Um, uh, followed by yes with catch and release restrictions such as no bait or barbless only. Uh, third is yes with general regulations. Um, but here when you combine the 34 and the 16, you see that you're, at, you're sitting at 50. So yes, yes has a slight majority over no. That's how I would interpret that. Next poll question. This is going to do with uh, pre-season slash in-season allocations of trout and the potential to shorten the stocking season. So Karen, if you could tee up that slide, pre-season slash in-season. Okay, so you can read the question. The spring trout stocking program currently consists of 570,000 trout with 184,000 stocked during the pre-season and the remainder stocked over seven weeks after opening day. During the pandemic, we front-loaded the schedule and stocked more trout during the preseason. Uh, 
however we do it, we're still going to raise a, a baseline of 570,000 trout. That will continue to be the baseline. So which of the following options would you prefer? A lot to think about here. So we're going to take our time with this one. Um, the first two options have to do with increasing the preseason allocation, which would result in a decrease in the in-season. And the first option would be to reduce our seven-week program to six. The second option would be to decrease our seven-week program to five weeks. All right, and, and, and with both of those options, the intention here is that the fish that would regularly go out in weeks five and six would be front-loaded to the preseason. The next two options are similar um, with a reduction of seven weeks down to, down to six or seven down to five. And this just uh, indicates here that we wouldn't really uh, preload, uh, front load the preseason. It's just that those weeks, that those fish for weeks six and seven would be redistributed throughout the season. And the final choice there is no change. Keep 184,000 in a preseason. This is the way we've always done it pre pandemic, and that's what we're doing this year post pandemic and then spread the remainder out over seven weeks. So right now, 64% uh, of the vote is in. And we're up to 74, going once, going twice. All right, we'll close that poll at 75% and I will share it. Uh, overwhelming answer here is no change. Um, let's keep a seven week season. Uh, with 184,000 uh, stock in the preseason. Um, you can see the, the, the smaller percentages there for the other, other answers. If you combine the, the first two answers there, we're looking at 26% combined anglers would, would prefer to see the, the seven week shortened to something less than that. Um, actually, and then you add the other 9% to, to get the remainder. So um, basically uh, 65 to 35 is what we're looking at. Let me launch another poll question. This poll question is relative to our fall trout stocking program. And the question is, the fall creel limit is currently four trout per day. What would you prefer it to be? And your answers here are one through five. Okay, we have 49% of the vote in, let's keep them coming. 66% of the vote is in, okay, 75% going once, going twice, Oh, we squeaked in another vote there. Close that poll and share it. So it looks here that 45% of folks are happy with the four fish per day. Um, you see the percentages there for the other increments. Uh, good information. Like I said, this is for us to get a feel for what the public wants, um, but understanding that we're looking at 170 people and, and not the masses. So uh, like I said, these, these questions and answers are gonna help guide us in our larger poll and in the overall management of the trout program. Let me wrap up the poll with one last question and this has also to do with the fall and winter trout program. Fall trout stocking, which consists of 21,000 trout spread over 36 waters, starts the second Tuesday in October over two weeks. The winter program is 4,500 fish spread in 18 waters, primarily for ice fishing. Is the Monday and Tuesday, uh, and this is the Monday and Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Combining the programs would be more efficient and it would save the agency money. If combined, all trout would be stocked during nicer weather, but, over, but a longer time before ice fishing season. So would you be in favor of combining the two programs? And if so, how? So we're not talking, this doesn't really relate to more or less waters. It's not changing the number of fish. It's just looking at possibly consolidating the fall and winter into one time frame in the fall. So to launch the question, pretty simple. Nope, keep it to two programs. Or yes, combine them starting in the second week of October. Third option, not sure. So we have 54% of the vote in. And yes is out to a, an early lead. Seventy-two percent of the vote is in. Uh, this, it's really increasing. We're up to seventy-seven percent of the people voting. Keep it open as it's as it's rolling here. Going once, 
going twice. Let's close that at 79% and we'll share the results. Um, here we have an overwhelming majority looking at yes, combining the two programs into the second week of October. 65%. Great. Okay, um, let's open it back up to the floor for, for general questions. Um, okay, yeah, I'll try to get some more questions here verbally. I'm going to go to Rosario Moreno. I'm going to unmute you now. Your hand's raised, and you should be able to ask your question verbally. All right. Uh, I just wanted to know, when will the uh, – they had a bad parasite attack in 2014, and all the brook and uh, <clears throat> brown trout, uh, you know, passed away at the hatchery. Uh, now, I had called a couple of times. I don't want to mention any names, but they said, yeah, you know, we want to stock them. We're just waiting for the money from the state of New Jersey. Is that going to happen anytime soon? Um, Hello? Yep, we're here. We hear you. Um, Lisa, if you're still there, do you want to hop on and, and readdress it the way, the way you mentioned in your introduction? Yeah, because I, I keep going to Pennsylvania, you know, to uh, all the different streams there. I know it's a bigger state. And they stock like uh, I don't know five million, three million fish. Uh, they got their work cut out. They're a bigger state than New Jersey. I understand that, but at least when I go, I got a variety. I catch brook brown rainbow and sometimes golden trout, and uh, they stock them in a lot of their rivers and lakes. And I just wanted to know when New Jersey will resume the process of stocking all four species, or at least the three. <laughs> Well, we, um, you must have kind of come on a little late, but we did address this in the beginning of the meeting. Um, we are not looking to reintroduce brook trout um, back into the raceways at Pequest. Um, one, they were very susceptible to the frunculosis, and once we have an outbreak in the facility, it endangers and threatens all the other trout that are within because the waters run from one raceway down through the next, and that's how it spreads so quickly. We are and have been looking, and, and there's been frustration with anglers, and um, that matches closely the frustration of staff of how long it's been taking. There was a lot of legal issues surrounding getting solar panels over our raceways. You have to do a whole legal aspect of being able to sell electricity back to the solar grid. That all had to be worked out. That took four or five years. We are now working on looking at uh, the support structure that would support the solar panels over the raceways. And that is proving a little bit more challenging than we anticipated because we have a lot of buried infrastructure um, underneath with all the water pipes um, that we have to be careful of as far as digging. And we also have just a very narrow concrete, you know, lip to the raceways to provide the support. Uh, for the weight of a solar uh, panels, but we have been, we have a couple of different designs that we worked at. We have basically had the first couple of ones did not work at all. We are now reviewing the newest design for the support, um, but we do not have a date for that. The bringing the brown trout back in is paramount to us somehow preventing the predation into the raceways, which is how the frunculosis got um, introduced to the waters of Pequest in the first place. And we are trying to do that in a dual project with solar panels to offset the cost of running the pumps for the seven wells to support the water. The difference within Pennsylvania and some other states is that their hatcheries are surface water fed systems and their hatcheries are on line with waterways that already have frontulosis. So when they have outbreaks and issues within the facilities, it's not as catastrophic as it is with Pequest. Pequest is a groundwater fed system, which fortunately for almost 40 years until we hit 2013 and 2014 with an outbreak of frontulosis, you know, is fairly disease free. Um, but there are also other concerns besides frunculosis. We had brown trout in the Pequest River back in 2015 documented with IPN, uh, which is another disease of trout, um, which if it was to get in our facility, we would basically have to 
uh, eliminate the entire stock. Um, so we are proceeding very cautiously because we do not want to have to repeat what we went through in 2013 and 2014, where we basically, you know, looking at the photo that Sean has up here, two rows of those raceways, so four lines, we basically had to uh, euthanize all the trout in those raceways after staff had already spent 18 months to two years rearing those fish. And we just definitely don't wanna go through that again. Um, so we we're just proceeding very cautiously so that we're assured once we introduce other species back into the facility that it is not going to jeopardize the other fish stock that are there. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, I think that's a very comprehensive answer. Uh, to the question, we know it's at the top of mind for most anglers here on this call. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like you know the, the question has been uh, addressed, you know, satisfactorily. So I'm going to ask, you know, due to respect for um, you know the rest of the meeting and the rest of the very important topics that might come up, I'm going to ask any, any anglers to hold, you know, just let's not keep beating a dead horse here. Okay, we're on the same page with you. We'd like to see some some changes as well. Um, Eric, do you have any other any other uh, hands yeah. raised? Yeah, there's still several hands raised. So I'll keep going down the list. Uh, I'm going to call on Andrew Nero. I'm going to unmute you now, and you should be able to ask your question. My first order of business is to say thank you. Thank you to everyone involved from top to bottom. I'm 74 years old, so I've got a good 65 years worth of trout fishing. So that's seen a number of the, the two hatcheries. It's seen a number of commissioners and superintendents and what have you. And it's all been great. It's all been great. Even the fact that you hold these two, these two meetings. I was part of the meeting last week. You know, you don't have to do that. I know it, it helps for you to get feedback and information from the public, which is obviously great. But you don't have to do that, but you do. And I, I appreciate that so much. Matter of fact, I even ran into Nick uh, this week. He was picking up a fish tank. I saw his fish and game hat. So right away that drew me to him and I uh, spoke with him. And uh, very nice. Every, every time you meet people on the road, they're always, they're always very cordial and informative. Uh, the, the winter trout stocking, the trout that you put out then they're, are absolutely beautiful. Now, you had a poll question where would you rather see less fish but bigger fish? Yes, I would love that, but it, sound, it looks like we were defeated on that one. But those fish are absolutely beautiful. And the good part about it is a lot of them hold over till spring, especially with this year with very little ice. So there was not much going on with ice fishing. So I'm looking forward to seeing some of those fish. I basically fish uh, Lake Aquatonk up in Stoke State Forest, uh, Sawmill Lake in the High Point State Park. And I started out fishing Lake Wapalane, which is now the School of Conservation. So I saw that some fish from uh, the Flatbrook was going to be limited because now the, the school is being taken over. It's being run again by the friends of the School of Conservation. So that's going to be a, a good point to see that school opened that was closed when Rutgers University uh, dropped it. But uh, thank you. Thank you all involved from top to bottom. Even the guys loading the trucks and moving the fish. And I, I used to go as a kid to, to uh, the Charles O'Hayford hatchery, seeing the little fry in the, in the, in the, in the, the little wooden ponds that were there. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the positive feedback. Um, it's always good to hear to kind of, you know, kind of lift our spirits. Uh, you know, staff puts a lot of passion and hard work and dedication into what we do. So, you know, comments like that are the reason why. So I definitely appreciate that. Okay, I'll keep going down the list, Sean. Yeah, let me just jump in. I, I just want to make a comment. We, we still have plenty of time. So if, if you feel like you haven't had your question answered, don't panic yet. Uh, it's only 1148. Um, you know, we're going to be here till at least 1230. So just to, to let anglers kind of know that. Uh, secondly, um, we do see a lot of questions in the question box. 
realize it because I didn't say this. If there are questions we didn't get to, we have the ability to reach out to you with email to answer your questions later. So sometimes there's questions that might be very site specific um, that we're just going to reach out to you in independent or individually. Um, one thing that I'd like to do is once again change gears. I think it's kind of fun to keep things moving along. Is <clears throat> I am going to uh, open it up to a specific question for you guys. We're always looking to improve the program. There's no doubt. We, we stock fish for you. So what I'd like to do is I would like to look for open suggestions. Tell us something you like about the program. Tell us something you don't like. Tell us, give me a suggestion. Give us something to chew on. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up your comment to the rest of the anglers to see if you're in the majority or to see if you're in the minority. So um, what I'd like to do here is just ask if everyone could clear your hand. All right, we could probably do that from here, right? All right, Karen, can we wipe out all raised hands at the moment? Yep, I just did it. So right now, I apologize to you if you had your hand up for a general question. Right now, what I'd like to do is ask you to raise your hand if you have a comment about our trout stocking program. That comment can include a recommendation to do something differently. It could have to do with the season, the regulations. Um, I think we've beat the brown trout uh, pretty well, so I don't, I don't know that we need to invest any questions in that. So I'm gonna ask Eric to look at the attendee list. Like I said, I cleared all the hands, so you'll have to re-raise your hand if you're interested um, and, and realize you might have to have some thick skin here because we're going to put your comment to the test to see if other anglers agree with you. Okay, Sean, yeah, some hands have just been re-raised and I'll start here. Yeah, next one down the list, I'll go to Matthew Greco. I'm unmuting you, Matthew. It's, there you go. You're Hi, yeah. Muted. Hi, good morning, how are you? Good, so, good. Uh, I had a question about, um, I, I personally love the fall trout stocking program. I think it's, it's unbelievable. It's, it's a great time to fish. There uh, is less pressure. Um, the fish are beautiful. My question is, um, I know a lot of some, you know, pr private trout unlimited groups will do a winter stocking. Um, I know Shannon's used to do a winter stocking. I don't know if it's new ownerships doing the same thing. But um, I'm curious as to whether or not there might be some consideration to either expand the fall trout into more of a winter, because I do fish all year round, um, especially the TCAs, and um, whether or not uh, that might be uh, a consideration that uh, the, the group would uh, take into account. Thank you. Okay, um, there's, there's a, a lot to unpack there. So I, I hope I'm gonna be able to rephrase this in a way that, that I'd like you to confirm whether or not I, I get your point. Um, you're wondering if we can expand our fall program into the winter because you would prefer to see more water stocked during the winter as opposed to the fall? Is that your question? My question is more of ex um, extending the fall program into later weeks. In other words, you know, there's, I think it's two weeks or I, I, don't, I don't remember how many weeks it is that the actual fall program goes, but you know, the, maybe the allocation is a little different so that it lasts into, you know, late November, December. Okay, so let me give one a clarifying point first is that with our current fall program, we have, we have 21,000 fish to work with. So I guess I, I would just wanna acknowledge if we were to take that same 21,000 and spread them out over a longer period of time, or a very different question would be to redistribute fish from our spring 570,000 fish and reallocate them so they could be stocked in the fall slash winter. Which, which one are you getting at? Yeah, I got them. Uh, yeah, so I'm saying the 21,000 that are stocked in the fall be extended, like, uh, you know, maybe you stock less each week. The only reason why I say it is because I think the pressure is down so much in the fall and the winter. A lot of those fish do hold over through 
you know, the winter months in the rivers. And uh, I, I mean, I've been catching fish all winter long, which is great. Um, so, you know, and there's, there's less pressure. So it would be nice to, you know, okay. be able to extend it. Okay, I think I understand your question. I will rephrase it one final time and I'll launch, I'll launch here your options. So um, the, the question I'll ask um, is, we have 21,000 trout to stock in the fall, as opposed to putting them out during a two week period in the fall, would you prefer to see those fish spread out and stocked over a longer period of time that spans both the fall and the winter? Yes, if you would like this angler's suggestion. No, if you disagree, and not sure if you don't know. 54% of the vote is in. We're at 61%, 63% going once, going twice. I will close the poll here. We're at 66%. Um, pretty split here, 44% agree. 41% disagree and 15% aren't sure. Um, let's close that poll question. Let me open the floor to another angler suggestion and we will create another poll question out of this. Yep, uh, I'm gonna go to John LaPerry. John, I'm going to unmute you and you can ask your question. What's the, um? Once my, I must have not have been unmuted. Um, once again, thank you to all. You're all doing a fantastic job. Agree with all the programs. What's the plan to fix the landslide down in the um, lower flat brook my, is my first question. And then are you guys addressing any uh, consideration about fixing the lower parking lot where it's all dammed up in the, in the flat brook, in the fly section, if you guys know where I'm talking about? Hi, right, Ross. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and answer that here? Um even though we we're going in a different direction at this point. Why you I'm sorry, answer? I just wanted to just, because I think there's other people down there um, that have mentioned that and we've talked about it, but I just don't know what the state is doing. I don't know if it's if it's a state funded project or if there's even any consideration to fix it. Okay, yeah, let me, let me start uh, by addressing the landslide. The landslide is on um, National Park Service property. Um, mm -hmm. It's a hundred percent their issue. Um, from what I've heard that their geologists have gone out and assessed the area and that the uh, the hillside itself is still moving and they have mm -hmm. no way of stopping it. So at this point in time, they are not uh, sure when they will be able to reopen the road, but it's a, it's a safety issue and it's 100% a National Park Service issue. Um, we are just as impacted as, as you are, as you know, uh, both with our pheasant stocking program and our trout stocking program. So, um, you know, we are also very interested in getting that road uh, reopened. Um, we are, as Maria mentioned, we are still stocking both uh, upstream and downstream in in that area. Um, you know, so as far as the impacts to the trout program, um, you know, it's really just an impact to our drivers who have to go all the way down to uh, the, you know, as far as they can, and then they have to turn around and drive. I think it's like a 30 minute drive that flip all the way around. Uh, to just come back out on the other side of the landslide, yeah. but uh, that is something that we will be doing. Um, you know, so the, the stocking program uh, won't be impacted there. I noticed that in Maria's presentation, she mentioned that the flat brook was getting a little less fish due to, and I think she mentioned the landslide, and that, that was actually a typo. Um, the reason uh, there are several stocking points on the flat brook that were uh, reduced over the last couple of years, but that actually has more to do with um it, it's more in the buttermilk falls area so again it's it's a national park service issue with that road and also the bridge there at, at uh, if you know where haney's mill mm -hmm. is that that bridge is not open for vehicle traffic anymore it's unsafe um uh so and at this time there isn't that is a fish and wildlife owned uh piece of property uh so we're working with dot on trying to get that reopened but i don't have an answer for you as to when uh -huh. that'll happen um, I think your other question was referring to um, within the, the catch and release section down below, uh, I guess for lack of a better term of describing it, down below Warner's Warner's Hole, I believe that's, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so, so that area there, um, you know, we're definitely aware of what's going on. Um, if you remember back maybe 10 to 15 years ago, uh, we had another uh, log jam in that area where Trout Unlimited yes 
f uh you know went in there and, and tried to remove the that log jam well this is this is that area that's what that area likes to do um meaning that uh it the, the river braids and and changes its flow um, we're looking into whether or not we can just get in there and open that up but at this time there are no plans to do that um you know we it is still going to be trout stocked um you can still access it i know the road is is that dirt road is is being impacted so um you know we're we're having you know thoughts on it but as far as the uh the stocking program goes that is also not impacted in that area will still okay. stop no, i just thank you very much i just wanted to know because i mean maybe the best thing to do is just let nature take its course because the river is actually rerouting itself through the woods so maybe something right that maybe something shouldn't be done and just let nature take its course but i just wanted to know if there was any plans just to see if they're do anything. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, your time. We're, we're considering it. There's pros and cons to, to both things. It, it actually, um, you know, as you know, that woody debris in the stream is very good for the ecology of the stream and the, yeah, and the fish that absolutely. we stock and the, the natives that are there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, a lot of things being considered, but thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. All right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, thanks for that answer, Ross. Um, let me reiterate again um, if we could all play along. And what I'd like to do now is have anglers raise their hand if they have a comment or suggestion of how to refine our trout stocking program so not really not really looking for general questions here or even like water body specific questions um what i'm interested in is to hear are there any big picture things you would you, that you really like about the program and you want us to keep are there any big picture things you'd like us to to consider changing and then I'd like to put that out to the anglers to see if that opinion is a popular opinion or not. So if you have your hand raised, I'm expecting a, a, a comment about our trout program at this point, not really a question. Okay, Eric, you wanna grab somebody? Sure, I will go to Glenn Thompson. I'll unmute you. All right, Glenn, you're unmuted. Ask your question, please. Uh, yes, on the Berkshire Valley or Berkshire Stream, the Rockaway River in the upper portion, the portion between Longwood Lake and Taylor Road, I'm wondering if you would ever be, if it would ever be acceptable to you to have a volunteer willing to float stock that entire area. Um, that you could reach out to me uh, via email as something that we could discuss um, at a later date, definitely. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, I'll continue going down the list. Uh, Rich Fackler? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, never mind. Michael, you are unmuted now. Please go ahead. Hi, I just had a couple of quick questions, and I want to thank you for your fall stocking. Um, I don't want to say the numbers, but I've caught a lot of fish just from January first along the must connect on river um there's a section on the must connect on river that i'd like to see turn into a catch and release area it's a small little area it's just getting a lot of abuse from people um i don't want to go into where exactly it is on here um but if i can reach out to somebody and talk to about it because uh I'm a center pinner. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with it, but it's like I catch a lot of grief from a lot of fly fishermen. They don't like us center pinners. Um, I don't know why, like a lot of areas are artificial only because I don't know if you're familiar with center pinning, but when you set the hook, the hook goes in the upper jaw, no matter what you're using, bait. And it's like there's beautiful water to fish, but you can't, I can't fish, and there's a lot of us that center pin now, can't fish these pro, uh, waters because it's artificial only and no no, no scent, no nothing. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why these fly fishermen, you know, they get these areas that all to themselves. Now I understand, you know, using regular bait with a, a ultralight rod, you let the worm sit on the bottom, they suck in, they suck in the worm and you know you hook them deep that affects the mortality rate 
but it's just it's frustrating because there's a lot of good water but like i said there's also a spot on the river that doesn't really need to be stocked it's loaded with trout but everybody's coming there and filling up their stringers because it's a state piece and it's it's getting ridiculous i mean it's a really good spot uh, and you probably know where i'm talking about but it's just getting way too much attention and if it was a catch and release only area it would be great i mean you could fish whatever you want you come there and fish but the fish will be there now it's like a grocery store to all these guys and it's like a little bit of disrespect but right. thank, thank you thank you for your comment um i'm going to ask you to after the meeting uh if you could reach out to ross uh, he's okay. a regional fisheries biologist for the area but i i am going to turn that into a, a general poll question and i'm going to keep it simple um let me launch okay. this this question here um here, here's your three potential options but but the simple question we're going to ask is would you like to see fish and wildlife consider adding more special regulation waters into our trout program would you like to see us consider adding more special relation waters or special regulation waters into our trout program? I'm not even going to go into detail of whether it's catch and release or fly only or this or that. Would you like to see more special regulation waters added to the trout program? We have 66 percent in. We'll give it another moment. Uh, 70 percent. Get your vote in. Going once. Going twice. Let's close it there at 73 percent. And to share the answer, we have the majority at no. We, we're not, we don't want to see any additional special red waters at 46%. Right there in the dead heat is yes. We would like to see that at 44%. And 10% don't know, not sure. Great, thank you. I'd like to ask uh, once again if an angler has a, a, a comment about our trout program and something they really like about it, something they don't like about it. And Eric, why don't you go ahead and see what we have there with hands raised. Most of the hands raised have been addressed in the recent, the recent conversation. So I don't think we have any additional questions at this time. Okay, um, so uh, what I'd like to do now is I want to provide an opportunity for Fish and Wildlife staff. Um, if you have any, if you've seen any questions in the question box, if there's anything you've heard that you would like to address, um, like I said, any Fish and Wildlife staff, if, if there's anything you'd like to contribute right now, uh, please unmute yourself and, and let us hear it. Okay, um, within the question box, if anybody wants to jump in, um, any, any, any staff would like to answer questions that are currently residing in the question box. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, Sean, I'll, uh, I'll ask or I'll uh, answer a few questions here. So somebody, Timothy Sagata asked again if the preseason stocking schedule is posted. Um, Timothy, no, uh, that is not something that we put out there because most of the waters are closed and all that would do is attract people to go there and, and possibly start fishing before the uh, opening day. Um, so no, we do not post uh, when and where uh, you know, places are stocked in the preseason. Uh, there was also a question from Matthew Greco about uh, eggs from the broodstock and are they, are the trout able to again produce eggs uh, after they are stocked and is it possible for them to breed in the rivers? Um, typically that year if it's broodstock that uh, our hatchery staff takes the eggs from, um, that is the majority of the eggs that that fish is going to produce for that year. Um, I think you may be referring to seeing uh, activity um, a lot of times in our fall and winter programs, um, you know, especially our fall programs when we stock uh, the trout in the rivers. Many of those fish are right on the edge of being sexually mature. Some are, some are not. Um, so those fish, uh, you know, not, not even the brood stock, uh, the, the production size fish um are right on the edge of being mature so they they do sometimes go through the motions how successful they are is is unknown um you know at this time but it's it, we don't feel that they're especially the rainbow trout they're not producing um they're not they're not sending a lot of fish into 
into the streams that are certainly making it to be catchable size. And, and our electric fishing examples, uh, sample and stuff, we don't see uh, very much rainbow trout reproduction. On that note though, all of your wild rainbow trout and all of your wild brown trout that you find in the state have come from hatchery stock. They are not native to New Jersey. So at some point in time, they've gotten established. Um, we believe you know, that, that most of those populations are self-sustaining and, and not due to our stocking program. Obviously we haven't stocked brown trout in how many years? There's still wild brown trout uh, reproducing in the state. Um, so, so hopefully that answers, answers your question there. Justin, I see that you answered a few people, um, I think probably directly. I don't know if you want to make any comments on some of those, uh, some of those questions that you had. Uh, yeah, I can make a quick comment, um, from someone from, uh, Rosario was asking about, uh, stocking Northern Pike on top of, uh, some of our stock trout waters, particularly in the Pompton. Um, we tried it as our best to separate the two. Um, it's a little bit difficult, you know, considering how much, you know, length of river there is, but, um, you know, with Northern Pike being also another popular species on top of the stock trout, we do try to stock both, uh, to provide anglers opportunities as there's not too many opportunities in the state where sufficient habitat exists for Northern Pike. Uh, whereas, you know, there's a lot more opportunities for there to be stock trout, uh, elsewhere in the state. So we, we want to be able to continue to provide those opportunities in places such as the Pompton uh, for anglers to enjoy if you like fishing there. But we also want to provide you know, places for people to fish for Northern Pike uh, in those areas as well. OK, um, do we have any other staff that has seen a question that they'd like to answer um, or just something they'd like to contribute to the meeting that they think is important to bring up? I just want to quickly say that there um, are a few questions about major changes to the program that we have not addressed in the questions. Um, and that's largely because, as Sean mentioned earlier, we are going to be running um, an official angler survey on our trout stocking program and changes that anglers would like to see to that program. Um, and those are changes that we can't implement at any time. They have to be implemented at a fish code um, cycle change. So those are things that will be addressed in an official angler survey, um, but they're major changes that we kind of can't make willy nilly essentially. Okay. Anybody else, any other staff have anything you'd like to add? I guess in addition, I'll just add to that, just you know, backing up with Maria, you know, I had a couple of questions about adding certain uh, fall stock waters a couple places uh, in my region to the fall stocking program and making some different changes uh, to the program. And, you know, I'm just, I just wanted to mention that, you know, I'm looking to, you know, collect data using that uh, angling survey that Maria mentioned that's coming out. And I'm kind of waiting for that to come out so that way we can collect, you know, as much data and as much support as possible for those major changes. So that way, you know, we make sure that we're making the correct decisions. Got it. Okay. Um, Let's go back to the idea of anglers asking anything they want. Um, please raise your hand if you have a question you'd like to ask to us. I'd like to focus on those. So anglers, please raise a question, raise your hand if there's something you'd like to ask us, anything you'd like. Okay, yeah, Sean, several hands just came in. I'll start with uh, Bill Gorling. I'm gonna unmute you now, Bill. Okay. Hey, just wanted to see. Um, I I haven't seen that the um open house uh, wasn't happening this year in PQuest. I just wanted to see. Um, is it a funding issue? Is there any plans to bring that back? Um, you know, is there anything that we can do as anglers to try to get that back? I just think that it was really a great, you know, kind of kickoff to the season. People would look forward to it, you know. And uh, I just wanted to see what kind of what happened with that and and what are the plans. Um, I am going to actually see if there's any staff from either information education um, or our administration would like to answer that question. I can answer that question um, unless Lisa wants to. Um, right now there aren't plans for open house um, due to staffing issues, but um, we will take note that it's something you miss and um, see if we can't bring it back one day. Thanks, Karen. Okay, thank you. Sean, I, uh, okay. I would like to to mention that I've seen a couple of uh, anglers are concerned that uh, that are certainly over 70 years old and don't get a CID or purchase a trout stamp any longer. Um, they're concerned about whether or not they're going to be able to uh, participate in the general survey. Um, 
I'll answer that. So, so the answer is yes. Um, we haven't figured out at this point in time if we're going to uh, require uh, a CID number. Um, if if we do, just like we have in the past, there is a workaround uh, putting in a, a different CID uh, number that we can assign to you. Um, you know, we'll have to address that, but absolutely 100%, we are interested in, in getting your input uh, in the program, and we will definitely uh, try to find a way to make that happen. Thanks, Ross. Any other hands raised for anglers that would like to ask a question? Yeah, there's still a couple, Sean. I'm going to call on Robert Coin. Coin I. I'm going to unmute you now, Robert, and you should be able to ask your question. All right, two things. One is about the brook and the brown trout. I don't know if it's been addressed yet, but a lot of us miss them. And then the other question is, I'm a licensed guide in New York, but in New Jersey, you don't have to have any qualifications for that. Is there any consideration for that? Did you hear me? Okay. Yep. Sorry, it was a little bit of delay in me putting my camera back on, but I, I can feel that. It, it periodically comes up, um, but we have never... Um, just for us being the ones to try and certify like who's has enough experience to be a guide or not to be a guide, you know, we've just never gone down that path. It's um, not really, it's not really about that. It's more about the CPR, the first aid and the water safety training that you need in most states to do it. Yeah. Well, there's caveat, yeah, all, all sorts of caveats to it. Um, like I said, it's come up periodically. We've had some general discussions, um, but, We've just never, you know, small state, but a small staff as well, um, to dedicate resources to a guiding program. You know, it just hasn't come up to the a top priority with our resources. Okay, what about the, the brown and the brook trout part? <laughs> brown and brook trout, we, brook trout, we have no intentions of bringing brook trout back into rearing at Pequest. Um, brown trout, we definitely do hope to. We are currently continuing to work on trying to get the raceways covered to limit the predation so that we don't jeopardize the remaining fish stock. And we cannot bring brown trout or other trout back in until we get that fully addressed. Understand. Thanks, Otherwise, I think you do a very good job. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. And, and, and in case it wasn't stated, um, this meeting is being recorded. Um, it will be available on our website. You'll be able to click the link to, to watch this meeting at, at your convenience. Um, the presentations will be on there as well. So if there's anything you've missed or you'd like to hear again, you will have that opportunity online. Um, I do want to throw up a poll question here. I have a, a Dane that would like to ask the question, do you feel that waters get fished out too quickly? You feel like waters get fished out too quickly. Yes, no, not sure. We're at 27% of the people voting, now 37, 39, 48. Right now, yes is in the lead. We'll leave it open for a few more seconds as we're at 58% of anglers participating. Sixty percent uh, going once, going twice. Close that poll at sixty-two percent, and sixty-four percent of the people on the call believe that our waters get fished out too quickly. I will go to Dwayne Chapman. Dwayne, I'm going to unmute you now. Saying you're self-muted, Dwayne. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, Sean, building on that question about. Um, you know, feeling that the let the uh, streams and stuff are overfished or not overfished. Like, is there any been any consideration on reducing the nut limit of fish that can be kept? Um, why don't you go ahead and propose an idea for us here? What would you like to see? <clears throat> I don't know, maybe four. Four. Okay. I will launch the poll question. Um, I will, I'll verbalize it for you and then you guys can answer. So don't vote yet. Um, the question is, would you like to see the in-season 
bacterial limit of six fish reduced to something less, such as four? Would you like to see the in-season um, six fish limit decreased to something such as four? Okay, 65% of the vote is in. We'll leave it open for a few more seconds. Going once, going twice. We'll close that at 68%. And 69% say yes. 28% say no. And three, not sure. Um, one comment just to make there is that um, in case you know not all anglers are aware, we do stock many waters that get warm um, in the months of, of June, July, August. So um, there, there, there may be some, some pushback for anglers who, or even staff who, who look at that and say, well, you know, if, if, we, have, if we have small creel limits late in the season, um, there may be uh, a lot of fish left over at that point in time that can't be harvested by anglers. I'm not refuting your point, I'm just putting that out there. So right now, yeah, 69% of the people agree that they like to see that. Does this question or result, uh, question or results stimulate any conversation? Does any, any, any biologists or staff want to speak up? Uh, any anglers want to justify how, where, when, why? All right, we'll just let that one go for now then. Okay, thanks for the question. Thanks for the comment. Any other hands raised, Eric? Any other hands raised for questions, Eric? Keep going down the list here. I keep seeing several of the same names keep reoccurring, so. All right, um, let me jump in and ask another poll question. I see in the question box, um, an angler would basically like to know um, about the 5 p.m. closure. So let me just ask the simple question, you know, where we have our, our larger rivers that are closed till 5 p.m. on the days in which you're stocked. I will ask the question, do you like the 5 p.m. closure? Do you like the 5 p.m. closure? And I will launch the answers here. Once again, the question is, do you like the 5 p.m. in-season closure on select waters? All right, we're at 63%. Get that a little bit higher. All right, we will close and share that at 64% and 52% like the in-season closure, 42 do not and 6% aren't sure. Once again, it's all good feedback, but you know, just we, we are pointing out that this is, is not the majority of anglers. Um, these are great questions for um, a, a, a mass produced survey to go out um, this summer. So 52% do like the closure, 42 do not. Um, I got a note here that there's, uh, I guess Ross, you said there's a few questions for Ed. Uh, yeah, Sean. Um... There's a, there's a few questions that I, you know, Ed, Ed could certainly answer as a hatchery superintendent. Ed, um, one of them, you know, has to do with how many trout we can raise. Is it possible to increase the amount of trout raised or is 584,000 the limit? Um, uh, yeah, we're basically at capacity. At, you know, the hatchery was designed for 600,000 trout, you know, and we kind of squeak over that annually. You know, usually we're about 600, 615. And that's about max. You know, you'd have to reduce size to get, you know, larger number of trout like that. And uh, I don't think we want to go any smaller on the spring trout stocked fish there. Okay, Ed, there's also a question here for you um, about the fall program. Let me find it again here. Um, Dave Bright asks, is there a chance of implementing a mixed fall stocking of production size fish along with larger multi-year fish. Uh, Dave, um, Ed, I'll handle part of this. Um, the, the fall fish are our production size fish. Um, they're just, uh, 
held over a little bit longer and and put into the raceway at a, in in numbers that are a little smaller, um, so we can grow them a little bigger. Ed, maybe you or Nick could uh, elaborate on that process a little bit more. Yeah, basically the fisher reduced the number in those raceways to get them to like the 14 and a half inch average there. You know, uh, usually they go out somewhere is about, uh, you know, over 14 and a half. Uh, basically those fish get fed about the same amount of feed, but they're reduced number in there. So if we, uh, if we tried to increase it any, uh, we don't really have much more room, uh, raceway space, you know, it's a take and give situation here. Okay, yeah, and, and the fish, the, the you know, the production size fish for next year, they would they would be at a size that would probably be too small, Ed, I'm guessing, um, for, for an interest in anglers, and then, of course, uh, they would be taken away from the following year, so. Um, yeah, they, they wouldn't be legal size. Gotcha. You got anything to add, Nick, or? Not really. You pretty much covered it. The um, the 2024 production size fish would be roughly like six inches at that point, um, maybe six to seven inches. Like Ed said, they wouldn't be a legal size to, to, to keep or, or stock. Yeah, and if I could add some like historical context there, you know, for the entire fall program used to be those six and seven inches. Um, where we stock, you know, you know, I guess the exact numbers, but 60 or 80,000, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a much larger number in the fall that we used to stock the six and seven inch fish. But through this process, talking with anglers, trying to always improve the program, we made that that maneuver to to change the fall program to the, those larger fish that average, you know, 14 inches. And from the, the feedback that we've heard over the last 15 years or so, that does appear to be one of the most popular decisions that we've ever made. Um, I've, I've heard of very, very few anglers, if any, um, over the last 15 or so years that said, yeah, you should go back to stocking more, you know, six and seven inch fish in the fall as opposed to those big, beautiful 14 inchers. One thing I'd like to add, um, it's Craig Lemon, I'm the superintendent of the warm and cool water hatchery, but I think everybody did a great job earlier with the presentations. I saw some questions and comments about uh, trout stamps. You know, where, are they paying for the the whole cost of fish production at the hatcheries and stuff? And you know, not as just as a hatchery manager, you think all we do is you know we raise fish and stuff. But over the last few months, we've been battling you know budgets and federal aid projects and things like that. And you know, just as everybody knows in the real world, you know, the uh, cost of inflation, you know, 10, 15, 20 percent on everything. You know, if, if we're raising the same amount of fish, then you know costs are driving up. Like you know, natural gas, electricity, gasoline, diesel fuel. You know, we have a fleet of 30 to 40 aging vehicles. You know, so just uh, keep in mind that you know, and the cost of fish feed is going crazy, and oxygen. So we're raising the same amount of fish, trying to raise more, trying to raise a better product. Um, you know, license sales, as Lisa mentioned earlier, were dro have dropped. You know, I'm not sure where trout stamps are, but just keep in mind that we're battling just raising fish, but also trying to give you the product and stock, you know, stock as many waters as we do. I've, you know, it's a crazy amount of miles that we drive around the state of New Jersey, putting all these fish in with these big tank trucks. But, you know, maybe Sean and Lisa could, you know, add a little bit to the budget part of that. Yeah, definitely well spoken, Craig. I definitely appreciate that context. And, and one thing, um, Nick, I'm going to call on you here, if you don't mind, because you, you've provided me a lot of good numbers um, in recent years. I know we're, we're probably dealing with round numbers, but if you could just convey to the, to the public the, the feed cost increase, just that isolated thing alone, if you could, if you could kind of construct where it was and where it's at now. Okay. And, um, and so going back to 2019, which was kind of a baseline number because the, the feed cost was pretty stable at that point for many years, like leading up to 2019, like a 35,000 pound bulk load of 5.0, which is our finished feed, was roughly $18,500 a load. Now, um, my last bulk load feed 
35,000 pounds is now approaching $28,000 a load. And we purchase about uh, 15 of those a year, along with various other size feeds. Um, we use about 500,000 pounds of feed a year, and uh, our overall cost of feed has gone up $150,000. Um, so it's been a pretty drastic increase in the last three years. Thanks, Nick. I really do appreciate that. And, and just to restate those numbers, one load of feed that's uh, uh, 35,000 pounds Correct. just a few years ago cost 18,500, and now it, it, it's almost increased by $10,000 per load. Yeah, I can add to that. You know, we were uh, used to be at like two hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. Now we're approaching, you know, we're three hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars a year. Yeah, this year we're probably going to be closer to four hundred thousand with the latest increase. Thank you. Yeah. Um, are there any other hands raised that we'd like to address? Um, we're looking at uh, it's twelve thirty-eight. Um, I'm willing to keep the meeting going a little bit longer as long as we continue to have a good conversation and dialogue here. Yeah, there's a couple of hands raised, Sean, and I think some of the people that had their hands raised that we had difficulty getting them on microphone, getting their audio, they've since put those questions into the chat box, and one was from Thomas Fox, and he was just curious about handicapped fishing access and areas like that, and what what's the current state of of that program, I guess, or if we're doing more for handicap access. Um, Lisa, is that something you might be able to address? Well, the focus in the last few years actually have been uh, towards the ranges where we've updated almost all of our shooting ranges for ADA access. And we did actually evaluate all our buildings for ADA access. Um, for parking areas with the new ramps, they do include you know, more ADA access in parking, uh, larger size for vans uh, are built as part of it. You know, so we slowly make progress um, each time when we're renovating and doing new construction. Thank you. Any other questions, either in the question box or with hands raised? There's still some hands raised, Sean. I can try to call on some more individuals. Uh, and give it another shot. Okay. I will go with Charles Hansel. Charles, I'm gonna unmute you, all right? You are self-muted. Should be able to unmute yourself now. Is that, can you hear me? Yes, sir, go right ahead. All right, uh, thank you for your uh, for this meeting. It's very, uh, very informative from all aspects. <clears throat> One, uh, uh, sort of an elephant in the room for me, uh, perhaps and for others. Um, I'm situated along the Pequest. You, you, uh, you know, the hatcheries uh, along the Pequest. Uh, one of your neighbors is the landfill. The landfill continues to expand. It's right on the edge of the Pequest. I'm wondering if there's any dialogue between the hatchery, New Jersey Fish Wildlife, uh, and the landfill, uh, as to, as to the keeping the, you know, preserving the quality of life in the Pequest, the aquatic life. Uh, yes. Uh, so, sir, there uh, just so happens that there was uh, about a, maybe it was last spring, I believe, um, there was some runoff uh, issues that that were uh, flowing into the into the Pequest and our law enforcement and compliance and enforcement department within DEP have investigated that um, and have addressed that. And I also wanna mention that the landfill has approached uh, our Green Acres program and uh, have offered up a, a large section of their property that, that is adjacent to the river um, and to be put into the Green Acres program that will also help assist with any issues uh, that, that could occur in the future. So. So yes, uh, DEP is working with the landfill um, and, and possibly getting that, that uh, piece of property into, into Green Acres uh, program. Well, as you know, the, uh, as you approach the landfill or you, you know, years ago when you approach the landfill for, you know, to, for garbage, et cetera, you could see the, uh, the water gap. Now you can't see it. It's, it's becoming just a huge, 
as you go down 46, it's, it's becoming a, a mountain unto itself. The pressure that it must it must be uh, that, that is exerting on uh, the, uh, on the Pequest must be uh, eventually very destructive. And all your good work could go down the drain, literally. Yeah, no, this thank you for your concern. No, we're, we're absolutely, you know, aware of the situation and, and it's outside of, of the Division of Fish and Wildlife, but within DEP, there are people, compliance and enforcement um, for one, and our land use regulations, individuals that are looking into that and keeping an eye on the on the situation. So thank, thank you for the comment and concern. Sure. Okay. Um, with that, I'd like to close the public question and answer period. Um, but before we shut down the meeting, I, I just wanted to go around and, and, and see if there's any staff that has anything else that they'd like to add in conclusion. If so, feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. I see Bryce, the conservation officer here on the screen. It's This is Craig Lemon again from uh, the Axtown Fish Hatchery. On that pollution side of things, I know we had a couple issues. You know, uh, a lot of our water feeds in from Trout Brook and Hackettstown, and we had a number of issues this past summer with some upstream construction going on. And literally, I called them, and within the hour, they were on site with DEP officials and were taking care of the issues. You know, it it, it, re it was a reoccurring issue, and each time they came out and it, and addressed the issues. So. Just want to uh, special thanks to the conservation officers for being right on right on board with that. I'll just briefly touch upon that um, with Charles's question. Um, we work hand in hand with DP compliance and enforcement. One of our primary uh, jurisdictions and and um, things that we put importance on is definitely preserving our uh, waterways and making sure that. Uh, we can go and prevent deleterious substances from entering the the water channels, as well as you know when they do get that mitigated, and definitely follow up follow up with um, you know any sort of penalties that need to be assessed on that. But um, as was briefly touched upon, uh, I, I think Ross was touching upon it. We we're we're very much in the loop uh, on any sort of water pollution, especially when it comes to you know. Any of our high value waters with uh, trout reproduction, category one uh, waterways, and any of the fishery biologists can uh, touch upon that. I myself has uh, uh, specifically gone out and, and done a lot of water pollution work in the past for um, our high, our high uh, priority um, trout waters. So it is, we're aware of it. We work very, very close with compliance and enforcement. Thanks, Bryce. Definitely appreciate that perspective as well. Um, if any other staff has anything else they'd like to add, uh, please go ahead. I'll give you a few seconds to, to jump up. All right. Well, with that, um, I definitely want to thank uh, everyone from the public for giving up your Saturday morning. Um, I know that we're all busy. We all lead you know, busy lives and families and, and, our, and our recreation and, and, and our jobs. So it's it's great to see here we are as we're closing the meeting. Um, we still have 110 uh, participants from the public. I think that's encouraging. Um, we ask you to continue to participate in meetings like this to help guide the future of our programs, which are your programs. Um, I guess the last thing I just want to leave you with is um, you're interested enough to be here today. Please tell your friends and please participate in the trout angler survey that we're going to be putting together. Um, if there's anything that's pressing, you can shoot us an email, shoot us a call at any point in time. We'll take it into consideration as we always want to make the program better. So keep an eye out for that. Um, go to our website. You, you will be able to find, not immediately, but you will be able to find um, this meeting, you know, as mentioned, being recorded. It'll be there for you to circle back on, share with a friend, um, take a look at those presentations. And thank you. Thank you, staff. I think you guys did an amazing job. If I could ask staff to hold on after the call, I scheduled a uh, recap Teams meeting. If you're able to jump on that, that would be great. Um, but as for all the anglers, thank you very much. And uh, tight lines. Thanks. <laughs>